Welcome back, Brad. We missed you yesterday. Hey, guys. Uh, happy Tuesday. Um, just a few things at the top. Uh, actually, just two things, I believe, and then I'll get to your questions. Um, first, uh, Cuba. The United, sorry. Uh, the United States is deeply concerned about the deteriorating physical condition of Vladimir Morera Bacalo, who has been on a hunger strike uh, since October to protest his imprisonment, imprisonment for peacefully expressing political dissent. Mr. Morera Bacalo was one of 53 prisoners of concern released shortly after the December 2014 announcement of the president's new policy direction on Cuba, but detained again in April 2015 for hanging a sign outside his home in protest of municipal elections. He's now in the hospital, reportedly in very serious condition. The United States urgently calls on the Cuban government to release Mr. Morera Bacalo. The United States also strongly condemns today's horrific terrorist attack in the city of Mardan in Khyber, Patunkwa, Pakistan, outside a regional government office. We extend our deepest sympathies and condolences to the families of the victims of today's violence. The United States remains committed to the people of Pakistan and to the Pakistani government's efforts to fight terrorism. Such blatant disregard for human life is unacceptable and contrary to the aspirations of the Pakistani people for a secure and stable and prosperous nation. Can we, uh, uh, absolutely. One quick thing. Of course. Brad, can you spell the name of the of Cuban gentleman? And can you say you said he's in hospital? Is he in a prison hospital? Is he still detained, i.e., in some kind of. Sure. Yeah. Uh, quick. Uh, so his name is Vladimir, Vladimir, V L A D I M I R, Morera, M O R E R A, Bacala, B A. C A L L A O. Uh, he uh, he was detained again in April 2015, and then when he I believe he began his hunger strike. Well, not when he began his hunger strike, but when he was detained once again, and then uh, began a hunger strike. Uh, and then I don't know whether he's in a prison hospital. I would imagine it, it is a prison hospital. But as far as you know, he's still detained. That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Brad. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have a <coughs> bunch of questions about Syria, and if uh, my colleagues indulge me, I promise not to ask another question this year. Um, <laughs> it's a bold proclamation. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I can make good on this one. Um, firstly, sorry, just to go through the, there's just to just to ensure you still have no uh, final date set for the talks. Uh, between the Syrian government and the opposition uh, or any agreement on the opposition delegation or the Jordanian terror list. Is that correct? Um, well, we did. Uh, so you've seen that uh, um, uh, UN Special Envoy Di Mistura has, uh, has announced plans uh, for that process, the political process, to begin at, on January 25th. Uh, beyond that, I don't know. We haven't confirmed any dates for uh, additional meetings of the ISSG or, uh, or of the uh, uh, between the Syrian government and Syrian opposition. And the 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 Sorry, delegation uh, is not finalized yet. Delegation is not finalized. And the I, terror list is still an ongoing process. I believe so. Yes, that's correct. Okay, and then I had um, some questions regarding. Uh, there was a report last week about growing. Uh, civilian deaths linked to Russia's air campaign. Sure. And I know you briefly touched on this, but I guess needed time to study it. Uh, do you have a comment now on, on that? And I think there was even a Human Rights Watch report before Correct. that. Um, well, uh, in, in a short answer to your question, uh, these reports of Russian attacks on Syrian civilians uh, are uh, extremely disturbing. Uh, as you mentioned, NGOs have reported that Russian airstrikes in Syria have killed hundreds of civilians, including first responders, hit medical facilities, schools, and markets, and led to the displacement of over 130,000 Syrians in October and the first half of November. Uh, of course, we're deeply, deeply concerned about uh, these reports of high civilian casualties. In particular, uh, we've seen a marked and troubling increase in reports uh, of these civilian casualties since Russia commenced its air campaign there. Uh, we've consistently urged all sides of the conflict to take all feasible precautions uh, to reduce the risk of harming uh, civilians and comply with their obligations under international humanitarian law. 
and that includes with re respect to medical personnel and facilities. Um, you know, we're focused now on, as we just talked about, beginning a credible political process that can lead finally to an end to the violence in Syria and, and a new political path uh, forward for the Syrian people. Uh, so what we need now are steps uh, from all parties that build confidence in these efforts and attacks on those most vulnerable uh, who, and, and including the attacks on those who could be part of this political process, and we spoke to this yesterday, as well as attacks that, as I said, kill innocent civilians, undermine efforts to find a political resolution uh, to which all ISSG members have committed themselves are, are uh, counterproductive. Um, so th there was quite a bit in that, and I yeah, just sure. wanted to um, thank you for the response. I just wanted to yep, check a couple of, of things. Yep. The you mentioned um, that this could undermine the political process. Uh, are you getting complaints from the opposition that uh, you know that are sure. saying why should we join a political process that you and Russia are leading when Russia is essentially so, killing us? I mean, look, what we've seen, and this happened. Uh, um, a few days ago when uh, uh, the leader of uh, uh, Jaish al-Islam uh, uh, was killed. Uh, as I said yesterday, we have significant uh, concerns about the group's behavior on the battlefield, but that said, this group uh, has supported a political process uh, to end conflict, to end the conflict, and fought against ISIL. So, uh, you know, when we see these kinds of actions taken against their leadership, uh, you know, it is our hope that it does not send a discouraging uh, message to uh, other members of the Syrian opposition who have gone to Riyadh, who have uh, expressed a willingness to take part in this process. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it certainly uh, sends a counterproductive message. Do you know if that uh, strike on Jaish, the one that killed Alush, was that Russian-operated or Syrian-operated? Um, I don't know that we've received uh, uh, absolute confirmation uh, that it was either Syrian or Russian, uh, but uh, I can tell you that uh, in his call yesterday to uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, Secretary Kerry did discuss these same concerns with him, uh, and that, including the fact that Russian uh, airstrikes in Syria have killed hundreds of civilians. So hold on. Please, hold yeah, on, yeah, that's okay. Sorry. I just have last, a couple more. These are the last questions that of 2015. That was my caveat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the just reports, didn't say there were an hour of them. It's okay. Um, the we agreed to it. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> offer it. You didn't respond. Now, please continue, Red. not reopen the negotiation now. In all seriousness. Um, that's right. Uh, the reports also suggested cluster munitions, unguided bombs being fired into civilian areas. Can you confirm uh, such occurrences? Um, on uh, specifically speaking to cluster munitions, we have seen those reports, um, uh, um, including other reports uh, of uh, of other uh, types of uh, munitions used against civilians. Um, hold on, just one second. No, I don't have anything here that, that conclusively points to or, or that conclusively speaks to the use of cluster munitions. Um, we have expressed these concerns, though, uh, about their use in the past. Okay. And do you know if uh, humanitarian aid groups are having trouble because of Russian attacks that are either indiscriminate or leave unexploded bomblets around? Uh, yes, uh, that is something. That, and you know, frankly, we've. Um, uh, We've also expressed this, uh, our concerns about this to uh, the Russian government, uh, that, you know, this, uh, these indiscriminate attacks, as I talked about, on infrastructure, on medical facilities, on civilians, uh, does uh, hamper uh, the efforts to, uh, in, to get that humanitarian assistance to where it's most needed. Absolutely. And then just lastly, and yep. this is lastly, okay. uh, can you provide any more detail on the conversation the Secretary had with Foreign Minister Lavrov? Since you raised a variety of concerns, uh, was there a willingness to address these? Was there, uh, did he reject that Russia has killed? We've heard public announcements that the Russians say they haven't killed anybody, uh, any civilians. Uh, so how, what, what was the tenor of the call and what was the response? Sure. Um, 
So, um, so during his call, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, Secretary Kerry did uh, discuss our concerns about Russian airstrikes uh, killing hundreds of civilians. Uh, he also highlighted our concern that the killing of uh, uh, Jaish al Islam uh, leader Zahran Alush, uh, who, as I said, was the leader of a group that supported a political process to end the conflict, uh, complicates our efforts to bring about a meaningful political negotiated settlement as well as a nationwide ceasefire. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to characterize uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov's response, uh, but uh, that was certainly conveyed to him. Uh, as for the tenor or tone of the call, uh, look, I mean, we've had uh, uh, frank and open exchanges in the past with Russia. Uh, that is the kind of relationship that the Secretary has with Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, we have, at times in the past, uh, uh, six months to a year, seen uh, Russia play a more positive or constructive role on the political side of uh, resolving the uh, Syrian conflict. Uh, we'd like to see that now manifested on the, the uh, kinetic side. If you will. One more yeah, on this. Yeah, sure. um, uh, you said that there has been a marked and troubling increase in civilian casualties in Syria since Russia began its airstrikes last year. Do you ascribe that marked and troubling increase specifically to the Russian airstrikes? In other words, that's what you think is responsible for it. It's not an increase in unrelated violence or activity that's causing this. Um, I, I think uh, we would say that uh, given the timing, given the, what we've seen uh, through our own sources, but obviously uh, through many credible, the reporting of many credible NGOs on the ground, uh, that uh, uh, to a significant extent, this is this is uh, due to Russian airstrikes. Yes, sir. Just quickly follow up. Now, you mentioned something like 130,000 civilians have been displaced. How did you arrive at these figures? 130,000 yes, uh, displacing 130, 130,000 Syrians in October in the first half of November. Okay. Again, uh, much which, of it is through the reporting area? of which, credible which, which area? Which credible villages and towns. Sure, and so on. I don't have a list of the villages. Credible NGOs oh, uh, on the ground. Well, Okay. Uh, and uh, I don't have a, I don't have a, a okay. I would refer you to them, including I think Amnesty International just came out with a. Uh, 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 on the Alush and Jesh al Islam, I mean, yeah. their manifesto is not really that much different than many of the other extremist groups. I mean, it calls for Islamic caliphate, uh, it calls for Sharia law, it calls for, you know, basically non inclusive kind of, of governing. So, what makes them, you know, acceptable? Uh, to you um, in any kind of negotiation. Sure, and, and yeah. let me be clear. When I spoke about uh, Alush and Jaish al-Islam, uh, I, I did say that we do have significant concerns about uh, uh, their philosophy, their, uh, their beliefs, uh, and uh, as well as their uh, behavior on the battlefield. Uh, that said, uh, they did uh, travel to Saudi Arabia. They did participate in this process in good faith and did say that uh, committed themselves uh, to uh, the political process. Uh, you know, this is uh, not an easy process overall, and, and, and that's among all the stakeholders uh, in the ISSG as they look at and vet these groups uh, to decide who is a, a member of, the, who could be considered a member of the credible Syrian opposition and who cannot. Part of that, though, I think has to, with the exception, and there are a few exceptions, al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, ISIL, obviously, um, uh, but, uh, but you know, as we vet these groups, uh, part of that has to be those who are willing to say, we will, uh, uh, we will no longer carry out violence, we will no longer carry out attacks, uh, we will take part in this process, it has to be uh, one of the baselines that we judge these groups by. Would you attribute that, or should that be attributed to the fact that they have such a close relationship in terms of being financed, armed, and so on by this? The Saudi government is that would that be a, I mean is that why in your view they have accepted to be part of that process? Uh, I'm not going to speak on behalf of them uh, or, or on their behalf rather. Um, I uh, so I can't speak to what their motivations might be. Uh, all we can judge is that uh, is is them by all we can judge them by is their behavior, and they did come to this process and take place in it, come to this meeting rather. My, my, my last question, yeah, sure. if, if, I, if I may. How do you expect, you know, these, I mean, there are dozens, literally, maybe hundreds even, uh, of these groups and so on. How do you expect them at, at the end of the day to be, let's say, 
determined to be uh, partners on, on this table. Who's going to determine sure. that? Sure. So I don't want to get too far ahead of the process. I can assure you that these are all topics of conversation among uh, the different members of the ISSG as we vet some of these groups, uh, the different groups, uh, the different uh, governments or countries uh, who are part members of that group um, vet these uh, opposition groups. Um, that is part of the calculation, recognizing that it is a hard job. Uh, I, I don't want to get into how they're going to make the final determination on that. Uh, part of it is creating these lists, uh, talking through the pros and cons for each group. Uh, some countries, some governments, some of these stakeholders feel very differently about certain groups on this list. So trying to build a consensus around that. Uh, and then ultimately trying to put in place a, a ceasefire uh, by which all uh, members can be judged, including the, the, the regime. Uh, by their actions to uphold that ceasefire. So it's a very complicated, very complex process. Go ahead. Yeah, why would the Secretary raise his concerns about the <clears throat> killing of the Jewish Islam leader with Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, if you didn't suspect that it was, in fact, a Russian airstrike that had killed him? Well, um, let me ask sure. simply, do sure. you suspect that it was a Russian airstrike that killed him? Well, I said we, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, no, that's okay. Yeah, we don't have absolute certainty. Um, um, uh, so, uh, but we do know that uh, Russia has been supporting uh, the regime uh, through its military airstrikes. So regardless whether it was the regime, whether it was Russia that carried out these airstrikes, Russia has helped enable the, the regime to carry out uh, more aggressive airstrikes on some of these opposition groups. And I think the Secretary was merely highlighting to Foreign Minister Lavrov the fact that, uh, you know, we ha do have a political process, al albeit a nascent one, uh, uh, underway, and we're going to need these groups that have expressed a desire to participate in that process, offer them some kind of uh, assurance that they're not going to be targeted, continually targeted. Uh, for coming to the table for offering uh, to be part of that process. So, so it was his message to Foreign Minister Lavrov, please don't you, Russia, kill these people, and can you please uh, urge the Syrian government not to kill these people? More or less, yes. I and mean, I think that's, I mean, you know, I mean, um, yes, I mean, I think that, 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 we recognize their influence, obviously, uh, and close uh, uh, relationship with the Assad regime. So, yeah. Um, and um, uh, I know you don't want to characterize Foreign Minister Lavrov's response, but have you gotten any traction with Russia from the notion that it is unhelpful to kill people who say they're willing to come to the table? Have we gotten any traction from them? I think, uh, again, with the caveat that I don't want to speak uh, on behalf of Russia. Um, it's not my job uh, or my role. Um, but I think uh, all members of the ISSG recognize fundamentally that that, is, that has got to be uh, a precondition for this whole process moving forward. And lastly, does this not illustrate the intrinsic and significant challenge in determining who is in, as, as Brad alluded to, who is in the, quote, terrorist group category against which, if there ever is a ceasefire, uh, military options, operations will continue. I mean, maybe the Russians and the Syrians think this person was a, quote, terrorist, and you guys say, well, but he's willing to negotiate, so don't kill him. And they say, well, he's a terrorist. I mean, doesn't this, in a, in a nutshell, show how hard it is for you to make distinctions, for you to agree on distinctions uh, uh, with your partners in the ISSC? So, uh, totally valid point. Uh, and I, uh, I tried to speak at least to this uh, in my response to uh, Saeed's question, which is, um, you know, we recognize that this is a tremendous challenge. I mean, there are clearly some groups uh, – that are recognized uh, by the majority, uh, and again, al-Nusra, ISIL, of course, uh, as uh, uh, who can never be, rather, a, a members or part of the Syrian opposition. But then there are, are a, a, a number of groups uh, uh, 
one stakeholder country groups might uh, feel that they're uh, they can be part of the credible Syrian opposition. Others may feel differently. That's all part of this vetting process that we're going through now, uh, and it's very difficult. And uh, and so when you have uh, uh, strikes like this, attacks like this against uh, those opposition members or those uh, leaders of those groups, uh, it certainly complicates the, the situation. Intervention, but yeah, I'll, sure. I'll phrase wait, it as a wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, you can't, I have you know, it. Let our, let our shot finish and, and I'll go back, back to you. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you a do-over because I actually have something for you too as well, so. Okay. For shame. <laughs> um, there is a difference between Russia carrying out the strike and Syria carrying out, uh, uh, carrying out the strike. I mean, you call Syria a state sponsor of terror. You accuse it of committing war crimes and crimes against humanity in this war. And Russia is the country you have most worked with to invite people like Alush or his group to the negotiating table. So the notion that regardless of who did it, it's a problem, that it, it seems, I think, to most people that it, it matters a lot. Who, so, who sure. did it? Because one's at war and the other says it's trying to facilitate a peace process with these guys. So I, I think it speaks, Brad, to the broader point I've been trying to make uh, in, in response to your question and others, is that you know, um, on the political track, Russia has played a constructive role. But on the military track, uh, and, uh, and I've spoken to this about the large number of uh, airstrikes against uh, uh, civilian infrastructure and civilians themselves, but also the fact that by enabling uh, Assad uh, and his regime to continue to carry out airstrikes, whether they, whether that was a specifically a Russian airstrike or not, whether it was a Syrian airstrike, you know, uh, they have been actively involved in an intense air campaign over Syria since September uh, 30th. So, by the way, you mentioned. I apologize. Um, uh, you, you asked about confirming uh, recent reports about cluster munitions, Russian cluster munitions, and airstrikes. Um, so we have seen a marked and troubling increase in reports of civilian casualties, as I talked about, since Russia commenced its air campaign there. Um, uh, we have consistently urged all sides to, of the conflict to take all feasible precautions to reduce uh, risk of harm to civilians and comply with their obligations under international humanitarian law, including with respect to protecting medical personnel and facilities. So without confirming that they've used cluster munitions and airstrikes, or uh, cluster munitions, uh, we would urge them uh, not to. Can you please pass? No. Sure. Oh, oh, please, Pam. I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. One more. I'm concerning the um, Kerry Lavrov talk. Um, yep. Did the, what insight did the secretary receive from Lavrov concerning the Syrian government intentions for the Geneva talks? In particular, what, were there any indications on who would represent the government? And then secondly, following up on um, what Arshad raised, were, were there any indications that there may be pushback from the Syrian government um, on some of the members of the opposition group that might be part of these talks? Sure. Um, on the first part, I, I don't have that. Uh, I, I didn't get a, a full readout of the conversation. I don't know whether that level of detail was discussed or whether that's even been reached yet on who would represent the uh, Syrian government uh, at the beginning of these talks. Um, uh, your second question, which was about uh, possible pushback possible from Syria, pushback um, from Syria, I, I think that's you know I think that's expected, uh, and again that's where we rely on, and that's the whole, frankly, the whole idea behind this uh, group of stakeholders, the International Syria Support Group, uh, coming to the table, because uh, there are in, uh, countries, governments in that group who can exert pressure, uh, influence on the Syrian regime. Uh, to get them to come to a common understanding of who the Syrian opposition is. Again, that's all part of the hard work ahead of us. Please, say Yeah. Go to the Arab-Israeli-Palestinian-Israeli conflict. <laughs> sure thing. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, I asked you about the uh, Israel's plan okay. for expansion of settlement. I wonder if you have any comment on that, considering that uh, the, the plan will connect, uh, you know, the settlement. Right. You're talking about... Mali, the main, and sure. cut off and dissect. So, yes, I did do a little digging on this, um, and uh, uh, that's a bad pun in terms of uh, settlement activity, I, but uh, I, sorry, it was not okay. intentional. Um, but you're talking specifically about the Peace Now uh, yes. report? The yes, report uh, regarding the, the Israeli government's plans right. for settlement expansion, right. including an E1, right? right. Um, you know, 
our longstanding position on, on, on such actions is very clear. Uh, we view this kind of activity as illegitimate and counterproductive to the cause of peace. And our concerns specifically about the E-1 site are well known. Uh, we strongly oppose any steps uh, to, that pave the way for settlement construction in E-1. Uh, such steps, uh, we believe, are fundamentally incompatible with a two-state solution and, uh, frankly, call into question uh, the Israeli government's commitment to peace. Okay, just to, to follow up uh, on the same yep. topic, uh, the Israeli government also announced that it's going to confiscate 500 dinars, which is roughly 150 acres uh, of land that are under the Palestinian Authority uh, in, in, in two villages, one called sure. Kasra and the other one called uh, Juresh. Uh, you have the same thing, would you urge well, the Israeli? Because on, on that specific area. report, uh, Said, uh, I, I did check with uh, our, our desk on this, and uh, they were unaware of it. They're looking into it, so I don't have anything specific uh, to address, that, to address uh, that report. I just don't know. I just don't have any information on it or confirmation of it. I have a couple more. Yeah, sure. Uh, one uh, regarding the secretary's uh, op-ed yep. uh, piece. I mean, he spoke about it. The Boston Globe. Right, in yep. the Boston Globe, exactly. Uh, but he did not mention the Palestinian-Israeli issue. He did not talk about new talks or new talks. Is, is 2015 the year that the United States has given up on the peace process altogether or the two-state solution? Not at all, Saeed. And I, I think you as a, as a reporter and uh, – and writer understand that, you know, you can't put everything in an op-ed. Uh, you know, the secretary was simply uh, trying to lay out uh, some of the important and significant issues that he wants to focus on in the, in the next year, in the coming year. Um, but I think you know the secretary well enough to know that uh, he remains and has made clear <clears throat> that he remains deeply committed uh, to this issue uh, and to advancing a two-state solution. Uh, he said as much uh, in his speech at the Saban uh, forum earlier uh, this month. Uh, you know, we continue to believe that a two-state solution is absolutely vital, is critical, uh, not only for peace uh, between Israelis and Palestinians, but for the long-term security of Israel as a viable or democratic and Jewish state. Uh, so you think that oh, the Secretary maintains uh, at least the energy or the commitment to have something going maybe as Early in the next year? I, or look, I mean, I, I can't lay out a timetable. No, 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 I understand what you're asking uh, me. I, I just, I can't point to any specific timetable. I can just, all I can say is that uh, this secretary, other members of this administration are going to continue to engage uh, with the parties, encourage both of them uh, to demonstrate, to demonstrate through their policies and through their actions, uh, their commitment to a two-state solution. Uh, you know, take steps that we can build, uh, build from or build on. Uh, and find a way towards a two-state solution. We'll do whatever we can, obviously, to help them in that process. The, the reason I ask is because sure. uh, the Palestinian negotiator, Saad Berkat, said that he met with the Israelis in Amman and in Cairo, uh, and he basically uh, calling on, you know, sort of uh, uh, sorry, not negotiation, but not in secret, restarting the peace process under your auspices. Is this something that is likely to happen anytime soon? Uh, I don't have any confirmation of that process for you. Please. Two quick yeah, things. Sure. One, I know you said that the delegation for the um, January the 25th uh, talks in Geneva, if they indeed happen, uh, has not yet been determined, the U.S. Right. delegation. But um, can you rule out that Secretary Kerry would take part in that? I mean, is this is this meant to be sort of a working level? No, but this is a UN. Um, a fair question. We just we I don't have any details. First of all, uh, and on who's going to be attending that or, or um, at what level, um, and I think that's frankly that's something that uh, um, Special Envoy Dima Store is, is and his team are are going to determine and are in the process of determining. I mean, it is this is a UN led. Uh, meeting and process. So we're going to look to them to to speak to who's going to participate in that meeting. Okay. Yeah. And then just one other sure. quick one. Um, a <clears throat> senior uh, Russian official uh, <clears throat> at, at the Russian Foreign Ministry is quoted as saying that Russia is ready to, quote, show flexibility, close quote, on the possibility of easing uh, UN Security Council sanctions on the Taliban. Um, is that a good idea from the U.S. point of view? And are you open to easing such sanctions 
uh, on the Taliban um, in the context of some kind of a peace agreement? Well, I think uh, uh, the United States uh, clearly continues to support an Afghan-led and Afghan-owned peace process uh, as the shortest way to end the, con the violence, ongoing violence, and ensure lasting stability in Afghanistan and the region. And as we've said many times, we welcome talks uh, between the Afghan government and the Taliban. Um, but until such time as the Taliban demonstrate a serious commitment to the reconciliation process, uh, we're going to continue to support international sanctions against them. So is it's conceivable to you that, that oh, all they have to do is demonstrate a, a serious commitment to the reconciliation process that you might then cease to support the international sanctions? Again, um, I, I don't want to get too far into the hypothetical. Um, you know, there, there have been uh, peace talks uh, announced. Uh, you probably saw that. Um, these are all positive steps, uh, but they haven't gotten really into the substance of any discussions. And this has been a process, frankly, that's moved in fits and starts, um, uh, which is partly understandable. But uh, I think we need to see a credible uh, process uh, moving forward before we consider that. Uh, but why wouldn't you adopt the position that the sanctions should stay on until the Taliban has changed its spots entirely? You know, reached a peace agreement, renounced <coughs> attacks on the United States, renounced support for groups like Al Qaeda. You know, what, 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 I mean, the reason the sanctions are there, right? Well, Going again, I mean, you know, so. I, I said a serious commitment to the reconciliation process. Yeah. Um, I think some of the steps you just outlined would exhibit a serious commitment. This is something we're not going to just, you know, uh, lift sanctions based on, you know, uh, a, a good constructive first meeting or anything like that. I mean, I think we would need to see positive steps taken by the Taliban that show they're serious about peace. Thank you. Please, sir. Uh, I have a few questions about Poland. Uh, yeah, there sure. is a uh, new government hey, in how Warsaw. Are you? <laughs> hey, how are you? Mark? Good. Uh, so there is a new government in Warsaw, and we have seen some yes. Uh, considerable changes uh, in Poland recently. So what is the State uh, Department's assessment of the current developments in Poland? And could you also comment on this new law which has been signed by the President sure. of Poland? Uh, it's a law about uh, the Constitution Court. Yep. Uh, aware of the law. I, look, I think, um, Marcin, I think the, a system of checks and balances and judicial independence are crucial elements of constitutional democracy and the rule of law. Uh, you know, the United States cares deeply about Poland, uh, which is a fellow democracy and a, and a valued NATO ally. Um, and I think when we uh, see these kinds of actions, it's through that lens that we uh, follow them, these kinds of developments, uh, with great interest. Uh, we remain confident. Uh, about the strength of Poland's uh, democracy and the ability of the Polish people uh, to address these issues in accordance with uh, the democratic norms and the rule, and rule of law in Poland. Are you at all worried by those changes? Again, I think that uh, we recognize, as do many uh, in Poland, uh, and again, these, this is a fellow democracy and a NATO ally, uh, that any democracy needs strong systems of checks and balances, needs judicial independence. Uh, these are critical, crucial elements of a constitutional democracy and establishing rule of law. So, I mean, I think in, in that light, uh, you know, we would, uh, we're going to watch these developments closely. That's, I'll leave it there. Okay. Are you at all talking with the government in Poland? You know, of course. Uh, the reason I'm asking yeah. about this is an editorial that was in the Washington yeah. Post a few days yeah. ago. And uh, just let me quote, uh, quote a, a, a piece of it. The Obama administration should influence the government's course, and it should talk to leaders in Warsaw. So are you planning, trying to influence, sure. back channel? You know, uh, uh, what's, what are your actions sure. here? Uh, it's a legitimate question. Um, you know, obviously, we have a very close relationship with Poland. Uh, we have frank and candid exchanges with them on a variety of issues. But this is one of them. Uh, you know, we have raised questions with the government about uh, legislative actions that, uh, with regard to the Constitutional Tribunal. Uh, and we're going to continue to have these discussions with them. Uh, that's part of our relationship with Poland. That's part of our friendship. 
between two democracies who frankly care deeply about uh, the character of their democratic governance. Okay, and the last yeah, sure. uh, question, uh, Gazeta Wyborcza, a newspaper that you know uh, very well, uh, suggests that uh, President Obama is delaying his meeting with the uh, President of Poland and also that it is not set for 100 percent that the 2016 NATO summit will take place in Warsaw as it was planned that it may be moved to another country because of the developments in Poland. Um, I'll take your second question first. The NATO decided at the Wales summit, as you know, uh, that its next summit would be held uh, in Poland in 2016, and that decision stands. Uh, that was a NATO uh, decision taken by consensus, as you know, and so I refer you to NATO for any further details, but as far as we are concerned, that decision would stand. In terms of uh, President Obama's uh, schedule and his intent to meet with the new Polish uh, uh, president, uh, you know, I can't speak to his schedule. I, I would disregard uh, any kind of uh, allegations that he's somehow avoiding a, a meeting. Again, uh, you know, Poland is a valued friend, ally. Uh, we have a close relationship with Poland uh, uh, and the Polish people. Uh, we are concerned. We care deeply about uh, the character, the quality of Poland's democracy. And this is a conversation that we feel we can have with uh, the Polish people, with the Polish government. And we're going to continue to have it and raise our, our concerns. Thanks. Okay, thank Please. Uh, I have two questions, one yeah. on communications and uh, Turkey. Okay. I'm, uh, Mark, I'm wondering whether the United States changed its attitude on surveillance of its allies or monitoring its allies. Because I'm asking this uh, because there are allegations uh, there are allegations after the surveillance of the uh, Angela Merkel's phone by the United States uh, Intelligence Service. The United States administration stated that U.S. will still conclude uh, it is uh, those surveillance activities against the NATO allies. However, uh, there are claims that the Turkey and the President Erdogan are exceptions on this case because of the reason to get able to uh, follow the radical groups in Syria. Uh, so my first question is, the United States changed its attitude uh, on surveillance of uh, its allies? And second is, what is your consideration of those allegations on Turkey? Uh, Turkey is a NATO ally, so Turkey an exception for those uh, surveillance sure. activities? Um, first of all, that's a very loaded question. Uh, uh, look, uh, First of all, in response to have we changed our uh, surveillance uh, techniques or, or approach to surveillance, uh, you know, President Obama uh, has spoken to this uh, 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 multiple occasions uh, uh, since uh, some of the revelations out of uh, Edward Snowden's uh, 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 criminal actions, uh, and uh, I think spoken to, the, to about uh, how we're going to conduct ourselves uh, very frankly. Uh, and very uh, openly, uh, and uh, I'm not going to attempt to uh, parse that or change that. That still stands. In terms of your specific allegations about uh, 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 President Erdogan, uh, I've never heard of such allegations. I won't speak to uh, beyond that what our uh, intelligence activities may be. I'm not speaking in respect to, to Turkey, certainly, but in general, uh, Turkey is a valued NATO ally. It is a member of the anti-ISIL uh, coalition. We're working in close, uh, uh, in, uh, working closely with Turkey uh, in driving ISIL from Syria and from Iraq. Uh, we value their uh, input, their participation in the anti-ISIL coalition, and we have again uh, a very close relationship with them. We share uh, information with them. Uh, so there's no reason to believe that we would ever conduct ourselves in that way. Yeah. Saudi Arabia and Turkey announced a new strategic partnership. I saw that. And they, uh, do you have any comment on that? Do you see this as part of the larger, the broader coalition? Are you working together? I mean, we've seen or in did several that come occasions. As a surprise sure. To you? Uh, no, I mean, I've, I've seen the reports. Uh, I don't have much more uh, detail behind them. Uh, you know, look, I mean, this is uh, I, I would view it uh, just uh, judging by the initial reports as a positive thing. Please in the back. About Japan and South Korea, sure. uh, the agreement resolving the conflict mini issue. Um, the Korean government, based on that agreement, started to consult with the uh, uh, activists and advocacy group to lower the tension and calm the rhetoric and try to find a way 
to move forward. When it comes to the United States, there are relevant uh, groups um, trying to build statue in United States public places or lobby to the legislature to adopt condemning resolution to Japan or etc. So does your government have any role to play or consideration to that? Role to play regarding some of these groups? Inside the United States. Inside the United States. Um, I would just say that everyone uh, will make their own judgments about this agreement. Uh, but I do hope, we do hope as the United States, uh, that others, including here in the U.S., uh, will support this agreement and its full implementation uh, as we do. Uh, we believe it's an important gesture uh, that will promote healing and, in, and reconciliation, uh, and the support of civil society for this settlement will be crucial uh, to its success in the end. Okay. Is that it, guys? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.